Hello, everybody. Good to see all these faces. All right, everybody. Are you guys, did you guys download the PDF? We are sending the messages in the chat. I see some faces going up and down. Now, if I know anything, I've been a real estate agent a long time, and I assume that uh, a lot of you are real estate agents. Hopefully, this is not a hairdresser's convention, so you should be real estate agents. I'm going to guess that half of you don't know what I'm talking about when I say, have you downloaded the PDF? And that's okay. Check the chat. It is a, ooh, look at that. Sharon Saunders printed it out. Bonus. There we go. Okay. So we have a PDF for business planning today. We're going to be doing it business planning. So you can get set up for 2024. Go download it. The link is in the chat. Uh, and I'll drop the, drop it in there again. There you go. Go grab that PDF. We have people that are coming on. Uh, my assistant is in the back area uh, managing the webinar from the back end. So you just keep posting that, uh, Emily, to make sure that people grab that info. And I'll get started. Let me get us onto Facebook and then we'll get started. Let's see if I can actually go live. I have never been able to go live in the agent locator group. And I always forget to make sure in between doing these that I can actually go live in the group. Uh, give me one second. Nope, still permissions error. So I don't know what I don't know what's going on. Anyhow. Uh, I am Dale Archdeacon, everybody. I'm the founder of Smart Sales Coaching. And for those of you who have not done training with us, we specialize in scripting and dialogue training for agents and ISAs. Lead conversion, basically those hard sales skills that every one of us needs to be able to convert our leads into appointments, overcome objections, get contracts signed, and get more deals done. And today we're going to be working on 2024 business planning. Uh, but I just want to show you our web. I want to show you. Uh, I want to show you our website. And by the way, I just got a message. Somebody wanted to record this. We're recording this. We send the replay out to everybody, and we don't allow AI notes in the session. By the way, so no AI. You get me a real. I am not AI, although I look computer generated. Uh, but you get me live and real. And we will be sending out the replay to everybody. And just a reminder in the chat is a PDF that you want to download. So let me show you where our website is real quick, because at the end of this, I'll be giving you guys the opportunity to do a free skills assessment with us, with my professional trainers. It's not required. I'm not selling anything, everybody. It's just an opportunity so that when you're wowed, when you're amazed and you realize you really want to work on your skills you're going to be able to do a skill assessment with us. What do I mean by skill assessment? So we specialize in scripting and dialogue training. This is our website right here. Uh, we have professional trainers teaching those sales skills, like I said, that you need for overcoming objections, actually initially getting into a conversation, overcoming objections, setting more appointments and getting more contracts signed so that you can sell more houses. Uh, this is our website. I do a podcast every Wednesday called Cash Call. So if you click on the Cash Call button and you wait for a really long time, uh, we, my co-host and I do this podcast every week. It's a half an hour. Most of the time, we're either interviewing guests or I'm playing recordings from actual sales calls and coaching to those sales calls and giving feedback. So if anybody here has recordings of themselves or one of your agents or ISAs that you want to get feedback on, you can go right here onto the cash call page, click register for live cash call, and you can watch it live. Uh, and if you wanted to submit a call, you just click submit a call and it will take you to a Dropbox link where you can just add the file. So you just upload the MP3. Uh, and we'll review it and potentially play it on the podcast show live uh, every Wednesday. So that is Cash Call. And then, like I said, we teach classes uh, and we can talk more about this, but this is our schedule from last week as well as this week. Uh, in addition to direct one-on-one -on -one training, my trainers also teach these live classes twice a day, Monday through Friday for our clients. And you can always see what the topics are here on our website if you just go to class schedule. Um, if you're interested in all of this stuff, at the end of uh, this today's uh, talk about business planning, I'm going to be talking partially about skills and the ability, your sales skills, 
And like I said, one of the things that I'll be offering is a free skill assessment. So we'll run a poll at the end. If you're interested in having one of our trainers uh, set a time with you to jump on a quick Zoom and do a skill assessment, then on that poll, you can say that you want that. A skill assessment basically is one of our trainers role-playing with you to test your ability uh, around your introduction scripts, your ability to get into a conversation with a new lead, your ability to overcome some basic objections, your ability to articulate your value, right? Value propositions is what we call them. So think of it this way. If a consumer said, why should I buy a home with you? Or why should I list my home with you? Your value proposition are those things that you're able to say to them. Likewise, they'll test your ability to set a listing appointment, set a uh, buyer uh, appointment. So what they do is they just role play with you and they test those things. So that's a skill assessment. At the end of this, we'll run a poll and you'll have the opportunity to say whether or not you want to do that with us. Okay, so you guys have the PDF, have that in front of you. I'm going to go through the PDF. I'm going to talk this through with you. This is a business planning session. You're going to need to know your numbers. You're going to need to know how much money you collected, how many homes you sold, what your volume was, your units, all of that stuff for 2023. And then we're going to talk about your business plan for 2024. Uh, and as we go along, I'm open to questions. You can just unmute yourself. We'll talk about things. It's going to be super easy. Got it? Okay. So let's get started. I'll share my screen. So here we go. This is the business plan for 2024. You obviously start with 2023. We have to recap what we did so that we know what we did, how we ended up. And that way we can make some plans on where we want to go for 2024. How many of you, by show of hands, did not sell as many houses in 2023 as you wanted to? I see your faces. Just one. Mo, Anita, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Who else did not sell as many houses as they wanted to? Yep. Okay. Tolly, Val, I can't do the last name. Tolly sold all the houses he wanted. Good. We, so uh, this is a pretty obvious question. I kind of expected those results. Now, put your hands down. Your digital hands too. Preeti, Lena, Allison, Tolly. Put your digital hands down. Now. We already established that most of you didn't sell as many houses as you wanted to. How many of you, by show of hands, did not consistently do the things you said you needed to do in order to sell the houses you wanted to sell? Oh, there we go. The hands go back up. Okay, good. Now, you can put your hands back down. Thank you very much for that demonstration. I think we all know why we didn't sell as many houses as we wanted to sell. Yes, the market kicked us in the balls or ovaries, whichever you prefer. Yes, the news sucked. Yes, the interest rates sucked. Yes, the economy was difficult. Uh, and yes, we still didn't sell as many houses as we wanted to sell because we didn't do what we needed to do in order to achieve that goal, right? It's the reason I'm still a good 20 to 25 pounds overweight because I simply haven't done what I need to do that I know I need to do in order to lose the 20 to 25 pounds. It hasn't been important enough to me. Uh, as we go into this planning, I want you to start there. And actually, I was going to share a book recommendation with you later on in this, but I'm going to do it right now because if we approach this from... I wanted to achieve this thing. I didn't achieve this thing. Yes, there were external factors, but at the end of the day, I didn't achieve this thing because I didn't do what I had to do in order to achieve this thing. Then I want to share this book with you guys that I is that has been helpful for me so far. Uh, I got to look it up. And you know, it's so funny. I keep sharing this with clients, and I still have to look for them thing up repeatedly. So let me share my screen again. Where's my zoom at? So this book is The Motivation Myth by Jeff Hayden. I really like this book. I would especially go through chapters one through four. Uh, and then let me get my book. Uh, or uh, I would skip a couple of 
I would skip maybe a couple chapters there. I'm just warning you, it gets a little dry in the middle. Uh, but chapters one through four, certainly. And then let me go to where. So let's see, what chapter am I on now? This is, doesn't tell me. Yeah, I'm in chapter six. So it gets a little dry after four, somewhere between uh, like chapter five, starts to pick back up again uh, once you get into like chapter six. But the basic premise of this is that, uh, I don't know about you guys, but I run a lot on motivation, right? And I'm like, nah, I don't want to go to the gym because I'm not motivated. I don't want to make my contacts because I'm not motivated. I don't want to grow my business because I'm not motivated. So I'm sitting around waiting for motivation to strike. And I'm like, man, why am I not doing the things I need? I, I know I need to do uh, in order to achieve the goals I want. Well, it's because I keep waiting on motivation to find me. And one of the things that this book really helps you understand is that motivation is not intrinsic. Motivation typically only shows up after you get into action. So after you go to the gym and you get your heart rate up, after you start making those contacts and have a couple of good interactions with people, after you uh, execute on a couple of your business plans and they work out, or you start to learn, or you start to feel better, even in art, um, most people don't know this, but I went to art school. I am a closeted artist. Uh, and even with me, you know, looking at the blank page or the blank canvas or the blank space is absolutely terrifying. But I also know the feeling of working on something, of producing something, even as you somewhere, somewhere in that process, you hit your flow state, as which I'm sure some of you have heard of. So it's also called flow state. Um, but this is something that is hugely important. And so right now through the holidays, when times are a little bit slower for all of you listening to this, I want you to get this book. I want you to listen to it on Audible or read it, or I don't know if they still make paper books in the world, but you know, if you like reading paper, then get some paper book uh, and you can read it with your eyeballs um, if you have time to do that, but get the book, listen to it. And it's going to help you because one of the things I don't like doing is making these plans that we're about to make for no good reason, if we know that we're not going to execute on this stuff. So if you have an execution problem, and if you have a consistency problem like I have, then you have to actively work on what are the things that are going to help me create a plan to consistently execute on the steps that I have to take in order to either achieve my goal for 2024 or get closer than I did in 2023. And this is one of those elements that will help you. So Get the Motivation Myth by Jeff Hayden. All right, let's go over to uh, we're planning. All right, agent business planner, got to share my screen, share the screen again. Here we go. Okay, so here's what you're going to do. Page one, what did you do in 2023? Your results. You should all know the income you got paid. You should all know your total volume close. That is how much in dollars of homes you sold. So for most of us, we can talk in units, right? Which is the number of houses we sold. We can talk in volume, which is the dollar figure of real estate that we sold. If you are in a market like, well, a lot of you are Canadian. If you are in a market like Manhattan, for instance, or maybe parts of Toronto or Vancouver, where you make a lot of your money on rentals because the rental market is really high and you get paid a decent amount of money on rentals, then just go according to income paid. You don't necessarily have to worry about volume, if that makes sense. But otherwise, everybody else is going to pay attention to volume. They're going to pay attention to units sold. Uh, total fallout rate. What that means is how many deals units or volume did you have under contract that fell out? So there's a couple of numbers that go through here where it'd be nice to know my fallout rate. It'd be nice to know the appointments uh, or contracts that failed or how many buyer uh, appointments I had that didn't go anywhere. But one thing I want to say is that there's a lot of numbers you're going to see on this page here. And some of you may want to fill all these things out and you're very number oriented and that's great. 
Uh, some people might be like me where you're kind of in the middle and you really only focus on the results, the kind of big numbers that matter a lot. And then some of you, I've already lost you already. And you want to actually go have conversations with people and that's okay. What I'm saying is you don't have to have all these numbers on here. The big ones are total income paid, total volume closed, total units closed. And then you can split it out by buyers closed versus your listings closed. Okay. Uh, and then if you have it, it's, if you have, if you know how many buyer appointments you set and met for the year, that's great. If you know how many listing appointments you set and met for the year, that's great also. But at the end of the day, if all you know is how many new appointments you set and how many new appointments you met, that will be good enough when we get down to your conversion rates. And if you don't have this information, this is something that I strongly recommend that you start tracking now and track for 2024. I'm a professional sales trainer and we work with some of the top teams and brokerages across the US and Canada. And what I can tell you is that every salesperson who can track closely, not even perfectly, how many contacts they've made, how many appointments they've set, how many appointments they've met and how many contracts they've signed, we can easily help them improve and increase their numbers, increase getting more contacts, getting more appointments to meet with them and getting more contracts signed. If you don't track those numbers, it's very difficult for anyone, including yourself, to help you understand where your efforts need to be placed or increased and where your skills need to be increased. So when we're looking at these, if you're missing a lot of these numbers, if you can't tell me how many contacts you've made on average per day, or even your total number of contacts for the year, this is something that I want you to make as a New Year's resolution for 2024, that you will track four key metrics. Contacts made, appointments set, appointments met, contracts signed even if the answer is zero, track it, know it on a weekly basis, look at it once a week. If you're skipping over your contacts, you can at least get your, con your appointments met. You could easily go into your calendar uh, and see how many appointments you met with that, like as a basic, and then probably how many you set also. Um, if you can get your contacts tracked, that's great. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it, be, it can be close. So you're going to fill out this information for 2023, right? Go through, put your numbers on here. Let me talk about the conversion rates as you're putting your numbers on here. If you see here, contacts made to appointments set. Appointments set to appointments met, essentially what that is. Appointments met to contracts signed. Contracts signed to, this is misspelled, pending deals. And pending sales, pending means in escrow or under contract, right? Not necessarily through inspections uh, for my Canadians here. Uh, however you track it, you can, you can, cross out pending and write in what your Canadian words for whatever you use. Okay. But you get the idea here. If you can track these things where, for instance, contacts to appointments set, your number of contacts made to appointments that you get set tells me two things. One, what is your skill set at getting into a conversation, handling objections, and asking for and setting appointments with people. That's one. Two is your proclivity to close people for an appointment. Is, are those two metrics that the contacts to appointments set tells me. Appointments set to, I'm going to call it appointments met. It says appointments gone on. Appointments set to appointments met tells me a couple of things. It tells me your ability to set a logical appointment with a prospect. So we can bug the hell out of a consumer and ask them for an appointment where they're just going to say yes 
to get us off the phone, but then have no intention to show up for that appointment. We can have a conversation with a consumer where everything sounds fine, but once that consumer gets off the phone, they change their mind about meeting with us or they lose the priority to do so, right? So appointments set to appointments met tells me how good you are at qualifying people and making sure that they see a logical reason to conduct an appointment with you. Appointments gone on to contracts signed. Now, this is the quality of the appointments that you're setting, the, appoint the quality of the nets that you're having, uh, and your ability to articulate uh, your process and your value and ask to get that agreement signed and getting it signed. And then under, obviously, contract signed to pending sales is your ability to ask people to buy houses, your ability to show them the right house and or get them to buy the right enough house, right? Your ability to take a listing, price it correctly and get it to actually sell, which you know for a while now hasn't been very difficult to do at all. So then at the bottom, what you see, if you look at contacts to closing total, here, contacts to closing, if you can get down to having a good idea of, all right, in aggregate, how many contacts do I have to make per day, per week, per month, in order to sell X number of houses? If you know what those numbers are, then basically you only have two things, two levers that you can pull to affect your sales. One is your skill set, and the other one is your activity level. We will... I'll throw a third one in here for the nerds out there who are thinking about this. You can improve your lead quality, right? So if I have to talk to a hundred strangers by door knocking to sell one house, but I can improve my marketing and get uh, one out of five people that messages me on Instagram to actually buy a house, those are vastly different numbers, right? So Knowing your contacts to closings is hugely important because there's only two or three factors that can change how many contacts to closings. Otherwise, you know how many contacts you have to make. You know how many or how many conversations you need to have. The other thing about knowing how many contacts you have to make makes it super easy because let's say that it's 20 contacts to a sale or 40 contacts to a sale. What that tells me is if I'm 40 contacts to a sale, that means I get to hear no 39 times and I'm still on track, right? I can make those contacts without being emotionally tied to the outcome of every conversation. And any really good salesperson is not emotionally tied to the outcome of their conversation. They're not hung up by it. They're not stressed out by it. They're not anxious by it. They can operate with a clear mind in the conversation. And that's one of the big important skills that you have to have to be a salesperson and be able to convert at a high level. Okay. So these are 2023 numbers. Hopefully you guys are working on putting your numbers in here. Uh, year to date, 2023 new listings on market inventory, closed sales, average price, and days on market. You want to know this about your market, not necessarily you, okay? How many new listings came up in 23? Uh, on market inventory, how many units are on the market? How many units closed? What was the average price? What was the average days on market in the market that you work? Okay, know those stats. This is one of those important things that when you're in a listing appointment and you can be able to talk to somebody confidently or intelligently, these are the numbers that you need to know. And what might even help you if you have time to do it is go back and look at 2022 and just look at the, the degree of market change. Because we are subject to our market change. If there are more transactions, then it's easier for us to get transactions. If there are fewer transactions, it becomes more difficult for us to get transactions. So it directly impacts us. Plus, it demonstrates your skill when you're talking to a new buyer or a new seller. All right, so you're putting in your stats for 24. <clears throat> Here are some production stats. Um, 
uh, conversion metrics standards that you can use if you're not sure about what kind of conversion metrics you should be shooting for. We've got new to two years in the business agents, uh, and we have some standards here around your set to met, met to sign. These are things that you wanna shoot for between sellers and buyers. If you're two to five years in the business, you're gonna be shooting for these type of conversion metrics. And then if you're five plus years, this is what you're shooting for, for your conversion metrics. Uh, and what we see typically is that agents within the first two years of business can improve the fastest. They can, uh, the margin of improvement year over year is much higher than once you hit that two year later stride and even then five plus years. It becomes more difficult to add when you're goal setting, when you're saying how much more business do you want to do next year? Uh, typically somewhere between 10 to 15% or so for veteran agents, maybe even 20%, uh, they could shoot for, but brand new, newer agents can shoot for like 50 to 75% year over year growth. So these are the conversion metrics that you want to use and go and analyze what you're doing, but you'll have to put the info in first. So then let's talk about units by source. Um, we obviously know we can track, wait, if you aren't tracking where your business came from, please start tracking where your business comes from. You need to know where each of your deals comes from so that you know what to invest in, what to double down on, what to improve on versus what to get rid of or leave out. And it will also give you a benchmark for measuring if you add a new lead source or a new type of uh, lead generation. So here you're going to put in your 2023 units by source. And if you have sources that aren't on here, you can just add other. Um, but basically, you know, you're going to have your, obviously your SOI, past client, past client referrals for sell by owner, not expired for my Canadian folks for the most part. Um, and then anything else really applies here. You may not have Zillow or some other portals available locally, but you will have your own agent sites, obviously agent locator. Um, so put your units here. And one of the things that I would say is if you are 50% or more running on sphere of influence and past clients, then your business isn't growing. You need to add in more sources of stranger business. If you are under 50%, then you need to make sure that you're, you have a good solid plan in place for your sphere of influence past clients. Mm -hmm. So hovering right around 50% uh, past client sphere of influence is a good place to be. Okay. So you're gonna add in your units where they came from because when you get down here, we're gonna start setting the goals for 2024. And I like to start, obviously, I like to start my goals with income. Um, because I'm a for-profit business, right? I'm not doing it for ego. I'm not running my businesses to prove something or to achieve some sort of um, personal goal. I do it for income. I do it for my family. I do it for retirement, things like that. And I enjoy what I do. Uh, so what I've found is in coaching salespeople and team leaders, there are typically only two reasons somebody does something. It's either for money or for their ego. Right. And so when I say ego, what that means is I've worked with team leaders who say, I want to be the top producing team in my market. And they don't even probably know how much money they earn because they don't pay attention to it. They just want to be the top selling team in their market. So if you're operating on ego, great. In that case, put that goal above total income paid because it's more important to you. For the rest of us mere mortals, we operate on money. So most of us are doing this for money. So put the total income paid that you're shooting for. And this is something, if you're a team leader, this is going to be helpful for you in guiding your salespeople. If you're a solo agent like me, I want you to identify with why do I want that much money? What am I shooting for? Is it to give me financial security? Is it to be able to buy vacations or a bigger house? or an addition, or cars, or pay for my kid to go to private school, or do these other things. Why do I want the money? What am I shooting for? What difference is it going to make? So if you are a manager, 
if you're leading other salespeople, that's one of the major things that you need to get down to with them is how will this goal attainment affect you in your life? What change will it make for you? How will you feel when you get there? Because just like us who have to you know, find our own motivation or manufacture our motivation, or you as a team leader uh, or manager, you need to remind your people of those things as we get into April, into June, into August, right? To get them all the way through the year so they can stay focused on what these goals are. So you're going to put in your total income paid, figure out our average sales price to get there. So if you want to move your average sales price up, which most of us do, or if you're higher end, if you're, uh, if the, if you're operating in a price range that is stagnant right now, you may have to move your price range to a different price range or expand your price range to encompass other price levels that have more activity and more opportunity. Um, we're going to look at the total volume close, total units close. This is the goal for 2024. And like I said, if you are uh, more than two years in the business, given where the market is, typically you can shoot for maybe a 20% increase. If you're under two years in the business, you can shoot for more like a 50% increase, depending on what your numbers are, or how you did in 2023. Uh, so here we talk about breaking it up and conventional wisdom is breaking up how many buyers I'm going to sell versus listings I'm going to take. And what I would say is for everyone right now, I want you to be focused on if you're not predominantly a listing agent, I want you to focus on doubling the number of listings you're going to do in 2024 over what you did in 2023. That's something I'm going to issue to all of you. Again, as a coach, as a trainer, we have hundreds of clients. And I can tell you in every single market, nobody ever failed in the last 20, 15, 15 years of selling real estate by being a listing agent. In 2008, in the US, between 2008 and 2013 or so, being a listing agent was kind of rough. But other than that, nobody's ever failed by being a listing agent. So that's what you want to focus on. So you'll fill in those numbers here. Now let's get down to your, we have buyer appointments met, buyer appointments set, listing appointments met, and listing appointments set. If you aren't tracking, if you didn't track in 2023, how many contacts to appointments to met appointments, right? To set to met. It might be a little difficult for you to put these numbers in here because you don't quite know. If you did track, then you already know how many buyers you set and how many buyers you met, how many listings you set, and how many listings you met. And that is super powerful for you. But if you don't have it, then generally a, a rule of thumb is you've got to set probably uh, two buyer appointments or three buyer appointments to meet one. And usually you're going to set one, you're going to be a one for one on listings set to listings met or two to one uh, on listing set to listing met. Again, it just depends on your skill and how long you've been in the business. This one here that I want to point out to you, new contacts added to database as you're going through this, this is huge. So the strength of any business, of any team is its database. Almost all real estate teams and individuals, and to, to a certain extent, brokerages, operate based on the database of people that they can market to, who know their brand, who know their name, and who either have had an experience with them or uh, are seeing their, their marketing on, on a regular basis. So what you want to focus on, and, and something I would do also as an exercise is go, you'll see it, I believe back on this page here, new contacts added to database, go and figure out how many contacts did I add to my database in 2023? The number of contacts that you added to your database is a direct correlation typically to how much business you do. 
depending on how well you contact or talk to that database. But the very simple math is how many people did I add to this database is a direct reflection of how many deals I did. So go look at that for 23, come up with a target for 24, and then you can break it down by month and say, and I would do that on this line over here, right? So how many new contacts am I going to add to the database in 2024 and break that by 12? So how many do I have to add per month? Good. Um, and now we have obviously contacts, total contacts or client events hosted as well. If you want to break those out, you can. Again, if you're not a tracker, if you can at least get how many contacts am I making on a weekly basis to have a running tally of total contacts made, again, it goes to contacts, appointments set, appointments met, contracts signed. Those are the four key metrics that you need to be tracking as you go along through your year. And if you're on point with your contacts, appointments, contracts, then you should be on track with your goals. If you're not on track with your goals, as we go through 2024, then you probably need to increase your appointments and or increase your contacts. It's super easy to be able to understand what you have to do to achieve your goal. Okay. Let's talk about growth plan. So we talked about your sources, what your sources of business were for 2023 and how many units you did. Once you have that lined out, you're going to go through your growth plan. So whatever your top sources are, you're going to work on expanding those. How much time or effort, which ones are they? How much time or effort am I going to need to expand them? And then do I need any resources or skills in order to expand those things? So for instance, if you're doing a, a neighborhood campaign, if you're doing mailings to a neighborhood, if you're door knocking in a neighborhood, if you're uh, running events in that neighborhood, so your farm that you're doing, how can I expand that farm? Do I expand it by people or do I expand it by touches per year? Which one do I do? How much time or effort is going to be involved in either one of those or both? What resources are going to be involved in either one of those or both? And then what skills would I need or have to develop, if any? So that's one example. If for agent locator, for instance, can I buy more leads in my area? Can I do more points uh, of touch to the people that are already in my database or the leads that I'm already getting? And or can I improve my skills at having conversations with them and converting them into appointments? So... This is your growth plan for the lead sources that you're currently working. So you want to do that. You want to go through this for each of your sources that you plan to expand. And here we're going to talk about adding or subtracting sources. So what I would recommend is that adding, you're probably going to have one source that you need to get rid of. And I recommend adding at least one more source to whatever you're doing for 2024, depending on how many you have. Most businesses typically run on, say, somewhere between three and four main sources of business. There's a lot of things that you can try. There's a lot of things that you can add or do, but usually you're going to run on three or four, maybe five, depending on the size of your company. So what am I going to add and or what am I going to subtract? Go through this as well. Okay. Uh, here's your plan of action. If you're going to be adding a new source of business, line out your steps. How am I going to add this new source of business? What am I going to do? When am I going to do it by? And how am I going to know what results am I going to expect? And I would say this for most real estate endeavors, if you are, you know, you're going to have to give it probably three to six months because it's very difficult in most cases to have a methodology for generating business, a lead source um, that will convert any faster than three to six months. That doesn't really exist that often. So if you're going to add it, have a, a plan of attack. How are you going to add it? What is it? How are you going to add it? And how are you going to roll it out? And how are you going to measure the results? Okay. 
And I think we talked about the importance of adding people to your database. This is the, the, you know, a growth plan in terms of your database. So set some goals. We talked about breaking it down to, you know, steps for getting people in. How many people do I have to get in per month? Uh, here you can line out what your value adds are, meaning what can I do? What can I send? What can I offer to my database for value? And this, one of these planning things that makes it so easy is if you go ahead and plan 12 months in advance, it's kind of a no brainer to just execute. You can give it to your team. You can execute it yourself. You can use a VA uh, or find simple ways that you can get this thing done quickly. Um, but once you have the plan and know what to do, that's, you know, most of the battle there to get through it. And then database growth goals, how many contacts are you going to add in each category in 2024? Your sphere of influence, social media followers, cold internet prospects, and agents. Agents are for referrals. You don't have to add all of these. Just focus on the ones that you want to add. Who am I going to be adding to the database and how many? Okay. So that is the planning guide that you're going to go through and execute. Good. Okay. You're going to get the book Motivation Myth, Myth by Jeff Hayden and read that. Uh, and then I want to just show you, a, I want to run through this real quick while, while we still have time. Now, this five key principles to hitting your goals in 2024 is part of a whole presentation that I go through, but I'm just going to line this out for you guys really quick. When working with businesses, with, when working with people, with agents, there's five key areas that we focus on helping them in. And these go according to the order of importance. The least important one being systems. I mean, when I say systems, I mean the CRM that you use, the messaging, the email campaigns, um, uh, platforms that you use, uh, whatever that may be. That's the least important of the five. These are all important, but the least would be systems. And then focus. What are you focusing on? I think you heard me. I mean, I've said this a couple of times. Contacts <laughs> made, appointments set, appointments met, contracts signed are critically important for tracking your results and knowing whether you're on track or not. And that focus is something that you have to have to execute on tracking that stuff on a weekly basis, week to week, month to month. And listen, I don't know about you guys, but, um, you know, one of the things, well, we'll get to it. It's number one on the list that I'm going to give you as an example for me. Um, but staying focused, focus on your numbers, knowing what your numbers are and continuing to work on them. How many contacts do I have to add to my database this week? How many appointments do I have to go on this week? How many people do I have to talk to in order to get those appointments scheduled for me to go on this week, each and every week? That's your focus. And then obviously training and practice. That's one of the major things that we do, which is what is my, what are my professional sales skills? How am I talking to people? How am I interacting with people? How am I getting into a conversation, quickly figuring out where I'm at, who this person is I'm talking to, and how I can get them to buy or sell real estate with me now or sooner? right? With a, a minimum of uh, objections. Those, that is training and practice. And so I, I didn't talk about who I am or what I've done, but um, in my past life, I was predominantly a listing agent, expireds for sell by owners, cold prospecting was initially how I built my business. And then I went on to uh, be a partner in a number two team in the city of Philadelphia. And we grew that from five agents to 30 agents and a hundred transactions to over 650 transactions. And here's what I can tell you is that working on my skill set, my training and practice, practicing role playing and really up leveling my sales skills made a massive improvement in me getting started in the business and in me being able to hit or exceed my sales goals. So training and practice, massively important. Like I said, if you want to do a skill assessment with us, we'll run a poll. Uh, actually, I'll drop the poll now and you can just say whether you'd like to do that. Also in the poll, we're going to ask you where you're stuck in these five categories. And I'm going to continue talking about that. So I'm launching the poll now. You should see it and you can take that poll. So did that poll stay up? Sharon Saunders is my 
a student today. It's still up. Okay. Cause I clicked it away. I just, cause I couldn't see. Okay. Yep. Good. Um, training. And, so that's training and practice, knowing what to say, how to say it, practicing it, having a professional trainer help you with it. And then practicing on a regular basis to keep your skills sharp is hugely important. Uh, consistency. Consistency is one of the massive killers of productivity. And I'm telling you this from my own personal experience. I personally struggle with consistency. I am a shiny object addict. I love me some shiny objects, man. You just put a parade of shiny objects in my face all day long and I'll be super happy. I am super unhappy if I have to consistently do something that has lost its interest for me. And so I have to figure out ways where I can can stay consistent doing what I'm supposed to do. That's one of the hardest parts. And what I find really helpful is I'm in a personal development uh, group and we meet on a regular basis and I have accountability and things I said I was going to do. And so having a group of other people help hold you accountable is something that I've found can be massively helpful in the consistency game. Uh, in our training company, obviously a big part of that is my trainers and accountability. So we even have a, um, a tracker that we ask people to fill out. I'll show it to you real quick. Here it is. So remember I talked about contacts, appointments, set appointments, met and contract sign. This is a tracker that we make available for our clients to use where they can track their contacts and appointments set, met, signed. Uh, so that they can review that with their trainers and within their teams, it helps to bring another level of accountability and consistency because most of us can't achieve our goals without consistency. And then the number one is mindset. And I was going to talk about this a bit. So we talked about the motivation myth. Listen, I'm telling you, mindset is massive. Uh, again, I said, I'm a shiny object guy. Mindset is really hard. If I'm not immediately getting results, uh, if I'm not immediately guaranteed that I'm going to hit my goals, I want to give up on them. And, you know, that's just something I've dealt with my entire life. But that comes down to mindset and trying to keep the right perspective about what I'm doing, uh, the right times to be focused on the long term game versus the short term activities. Right. So sometimes the short term activities seem disassociated from the goal. I have to reconnect them. Sometimes my long term goals are really fun and shiny but the short-term activity I have to do just sucks. And so, you know, it depends on where your mind is at and whether you believe you can get there or not. So the, um, tell me if this poll, you know, I don't see any, um, Emily, are you seeing responses on the poll? Cause I don't see any, nobody's responded from what I can see. I do. You yeah. see responses. Okay. Yep. Yeah. This is a quirk. This is one of the thing that happened with zoom before, for some reason, we're both logged in. I think that might be what it be what it is under me. I want to show you guys a couple of books around um, mindset, which these have helped me also in addition to that um, motivation myth one. So Angela Duckworth's Grit, huge. Uh, how to um, where you can find passion, how to ignite it, and how you can work on your own ability to persevere. Um, learned optimism by Martin Sel Seligman, super, uh, beneficial one for me too. And then mindset by Carol Dweck. So what I would say with this is definitely get the motivation myth by Jeff Hayden. And then what I want you to learn, I I'm showing you some books that have helped me, but what I've figured out over time is that each of us, myself included has to figure out what our own unique mindset makeup is what triggers us how what are the what are the negative thoughts or the negative impressions or the uh, process that your mind goes through that gets in the way of you achieving the things that you want to achieve or you taking the actions that you know you need to take and i believe that there are some commonalities across all of us but we all do have a unique makeup and a unique way that we think and that we process things. And so um, essentially, the reason why I may not take the action I need to take on a particular day might vary from yours. Uh, but you have to figure out what your unique mental makeup is and figure out what your own mental hygiene process needs to be.
So for me, my mental hygiene process is exercising in the morning and doing some meditation when I remember to do so. Uh, that is my mental hygiene process. I've figured, and listen, I'm not going to be on the cover of Men's Health magazine anytime during my lifetime. We already talked about the fact that I got an extra 20 to 25 pounds, but I've figured out that for me personally, 15 to 20 minutes of physical activity in the morning helps to shift my mindset. I'm not setting the world on fire. I'm not going to be the next uh, internet uh, you know, workout guru, but it works for me. And, and I'm a perfectionist. It took me a long time to get to the point where I could say, hey, I'm going to do 20 minutes of something regardless of how much physical impact it makes on my body because that 20 minutes uh, elevates my heart rate and I feel better, <laughs> uh, which helps my mindset, which helps me make the right decisions I need to make during the day. I'm not telling you you have to exercise. What I'm saying is you need to figure out how your mind works, what's in your way, and what strategies or knowledge or techniques or perspectives are going to be a good combination for you to be able to unlock and let you more consistently achieve what you want to achieve and take the actions you know you need to take. All right, everybody, I'm going to end the poll now. I can't see whether you guys have answered it. So let us know where you're struggling, mindset, consistency, training and practice leads or systems. And if you'd like one of my trainers to go through a lead conversion skill assessment with you, just to help you understand where some areas are uh, that you might be struggling. It could be with your intros. It could be with the, you know, an intro being the way that you get into a conversation with somebody. I'll tell you a little story. We have a client uh, and we were doing a call review. So we do a lot of call reviews in my company where we ask you to record your sales call. You bring it into your training session with your trainer and the trainer plays it, listens to the call with you so that you can cringe at what you did or didn't do and the trainer can help you with it. So we were doing a call review, this uh, client, her name is Nina. She's awesome. And Nina has been training with us for a while. And Nina shows up, she does everything, she practices. And then we play a call and Nina's intro absolutely sucked. It was terrible. And I was like, Nina, what the hell are you doing here? Uh, and she's like, I don't know, I was caught off guard. And I'm like, okay, Nina, here's the principles for getting into a conversation. Here's how you show up in the strongest way possible. So you don't just sound like every other telemarketer that's pestering the crap out of all of us. And so we fixed her intros and she felt so much more com confident and comfortable to be able to have those conversations. But the point is, I wouldn't have known that if we didn't listen to the call together, we'd been doing training but she wasn't translating it into the actual actions that she needed to be taking uh, with those conversations. So we did it, we practiced again, listened to it together. She was instantly be able to improve her ability to get into the conversations with those strangers. So doing the skill assessment with our trainers, they'll test you on your intros. They'll test you on some initial objections, you know, things like, oh, I'm just window shopping or just getting started or just looking for now. They'll test you and help you with things like, hey, Mary, why should I buy a house with you? Preeti, why should I sell a house with you? And they'll also test you on your ability to set up and ask for a listing appointment or a buyer appointment. So you'll get some feedback from them that way. I can't see how many people have filled out the poll, but basically, if you want to do that, if you say yes, we'll reach out to you. If you say no, no hard feelings. Um, and I think I'm going to end the poll now. Any quick questions before I go, everybody, about your goal setting or anything like that? Hi, Lena. Hi, thank you for the for the coaching and everything. It was very uh, nice and enlightening. I just had two questions for you, please. Should we include the commission split if we're on a team or something in the total income for the business planning? Or is it like really the GCI like is after your team splits? Leader, is your team leader on this meeting, Lena? No. No, no. Okay. If your team is not on this meeting, <laughs> then I want you to know the two different numbers. Yeah. I want you to know how much did I generate gross and how much did I get paid? Okay. Because the difference there is how much I'm paying my team leader. Yeah. So if you're with a good team that's providing training and leads and support and uh, all the back end stuff and they're helping you grow your business, 
then you should be spending a good amount of money on that team. If you're with a team where you are primarily the driver and you're really not getting any resources, then I want you to know that number because that's what you're paying to have whatever level of support you're receiving. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah, it does. And uh, the reason why I'm on this call is one of my goals for 2024 is to go as a solo agent, to go back as a solo agent. So I just want to know, uh, you know, what numbers I should put in uh, exactly in order for me to calculate all of that, you know, how much I should, how many contacts I should be making in order for me to be able to go on my own. Okay, cool. Like to break it down. That's great. Actually, yes, then you should look at those numbers too. Okay. And and also what I would say is that you, are you in Canada? Yes, in Montreal. You are exceptionally valuable to team leaders. So if you really are passionate about being your own business owner, great. I would never stop you. If you're not passionate about some of the bullshit that we have to deal with over and over and over again, just know that you have a very high value to other team leaders in your market who are willing to deal with the crap. Yeah, 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 I understand. Thank you. And for my second question, and then I'll let you go, just for the tracking, to track the numbers, you know, for the contacts and the appointments and everything, do you suggest that we do it like monthly or weekly? Like so at least weekly. Okay. Uh, for your contacts, you best practices are that you're going to track your contacts daily. Okay. I know that can be a little bit daunting, but what I would say is that if you have lead gen time, you can obviously, if you, if you have lead gen time blocks, right? So mm -hmm. let's say you say, I'm going to lead generate between 9am and 10am each day. That's very easy to track. By the end of the day, there's going to be people who replied to you, text messages that came in randomly. So you can just take a, an, an, a guess and add that at the end of the day. Um, right. You don't have to be exact. You can be close. So All right. Track your contacts daily, track your appointments set and met weekly. Um, and worst case scenario, if the best you can do is one time a week, you're going to guesstimate your contacts and you're going to track your sets and mets. Do that. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Some tracking consistently is better than perfect tracking never. Mo at Invest Property Group. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the the um, session. Now, my question is, you said something and I missed it about uh, about contacts that you add to your database can equal more deals. Did you say that a certain amount of deals? You have a ratio? Yeah, well, there is in the uh, Keller Williams, uh, the Red Book, the Millionaire Real Estate Agent Book. I don't know if you've ever seen that one. Yes, I have some, read it a long time ago. They, yeah, they give some numbers. I, I don't, I mean, I haven't seen a direct correlation really across teams and companies where I could easily say you get a deal for every X number of people. But what I can say is this, for all of you individually, if you look at the number of contacts in your database for 2023, the number of new contacts that you added and the number of deals that you did, there's a correlation across those three numbers, right? It, it's not scientifically proven, but there is a correlation across them. And so look at where 2023 was, how many people did I have? How many people did I add? How many deals did I do? And look into 2024 for your planning to say, hmm, okay, well, if that's how my numbers worked loosely last year, Here's my goal for database ads for next year. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I can tell you my training company, I don't, I don't have a particular direct correlation either, but I've got around 20,000 uh, contacts in our system from doing stuff just like this for like Agent Locator and other companies. Uh, and you know we have 150 clients. Uh, so we can look at how many clients did we add through the year versus how many new contacts did we add to the database. And there is some uh, loose correlation between the two. So one of the major things that we do is we're consistently adding new people to our database who consume our material and our coaching and get familiar with us because the more people who are doing that every single year, the more of them come and want to do training with us. Cool. That was a shameless self-plug. Okay. I will see you guys all later. Hopefully that was helpful. Get your planning together for 2024.
get the motivation myth. And hopefully you've said whether or not you wanted us to do a skill assessment with you, which I highly recommend. And I will see all of you the next time. Can I ask a quick question? Yes, Sheldon. Are you doing a spring training or anything again this year? Uh, yeah, actually, we're going to be doing a New Year's special that's going to be running between December 26th and the second week in January, where you, you're you going to get a special discount uh, on the training. And we're working on the fancy marketing stuff for that so far, Sheldon. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yes. Uh, awesome. Good seeing everybody. I'll see you next time.